Welcome to DIY 360. I'm Kevin Bow. And this is my dear old friend, Peter Anderson. Hey. Also known as uh, Peter Anderson on drums. So this is an extra fun DIY for me because uh, Peter and I have been working together almost nonstop for... Seven? Seven years or so. Um, on what year is it? Yeah, seven years. Seven years, a bunch of different projects. Um, and uh, Peter has a great story because he's typical, like I'm always harping in my class. Those of us that have managed to stay in this business and stay out of a day job, it's almost consistent throughout the industry that you end up wearing many different hats. Um, it's very rare these days that anyone makes a living just as an engineer. It happens or just as a producer, just as a songwriter, just as a drummer. And uh, Peter's a good example of someone who's uh, morphed into many different work situations over the years, even though, like me, he started out in the same musical scene, the early 80s uh, Minneapolis punk scene. Um, but as late, a drummer... Late 80s. Peter's a little younger than me. He'll be reminding you of these meaningless numbers several times throughout today's seminar. Um, <laughs> I, which I know it's confusing to you guys because I look so much younger than him, but you'll just have to reverse that impression. Um, so, but let's start with drumming, because you started out, like I started out just wanting to be a guitar player. Wasn't that your original dream of you just planned on playing the drums, right? Yeah, I, um, I started playing the drums for real when I was 11, and I had an interest in it uh, prior to that, but it kind of coincided with my friends uh, that I grew up with um, learning how to play guitar. We had all, all I, I had a, a group of close friends, these two guys that I had uh, been friends with since first grade. I think we had the same belt buckles or something like that. <laughs> and we were uh, very artistically inclined, like drawing sharks and dinosaurs. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, we liked music quite a bit. I'm not uh, completely certain what the evolution of that is, but I know that uh, as early as like third grade, our third grade teacher loaned us her. She had one of those boxes of uh, 45 records full of like Beach Boys, Beatles, 60s pop, 70s pop stuff. And she knew we were interested in music. She loaned us this and we would get together on Saturdays or whenever and listen to records together, trade them, talk about it. We're always doing creative things together, and that sort of led to music. And uh, starting a band happened uh, just prior to my 11th birthday. We kind of got our crap together. I had a paper out about a drum set for 99 bucks out of the want ads, <laughs> uh, which was this thing that used to be in the back of... Uh, yeah, uh, this other thing called the newspaper. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, so, yeah, I played my first gig uh, as a drummer in um, 1976. Were you playing at the talent show? It was a talent show, St. Margaret Mary Fall Festival talent show. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so drums were always, uh, you know, my interest in playing music was very much a social kind of like being part of a band thing. I had a love of music. That evolved, it, you know, as I became a teenager and, and really developed a serious interest in art and music. Uh, the sort of like drumming and playing music with my buddies who were also cultivating similar interests that all kind of went hand in hand. And I'd begun to think of myself and uh, my future path in a very sort of like... Uh, I'm going to be an artist, a musical artist kind of way. And that uh, was a whole set of uh, a whole set of ideas and influences that uh, created a path which I have followed pretty intently. It's, it's changed now over the years, but I uh, played in a band with those same two guys. The only reason I'm kind of talking about what the hell I did when I was 11. Because it's, it's cause important, I, though. It's because I played with those guys uh, for 13 years. And we had a band uh, until I was 28, or 28, or whatever, till about 1989. I played. And most of the time, that band was called The Bloods, right? Most of that time, that band was called The Bloods. We put out a, an indie record uh, early on here. It was my first record, was a vinyl record 
was actually the last vinyl <laughs> that I was ever on until a few years back, right. you know, when the people started doing vinyl again. Uh, but and you guys band, played like the en- you guys played was the entry your main gig. That band biggest? got a certain amount of attention. The news, the local papers, Strib would write about us. We would get opening ba- opening gigs for the bigger bands of the time. Run Westy, Run Trip Shakespeare, and we would headline Thursdays and what have you. Build the following. Started to figure out how to get on the road. Um, how to. Uh, put out a record, how to record a record. Yeah, my first uh, record was with that band. And basically, kind of everything, uh, it spearheaded, you know, everything that was to come in, in terms. I was thinking about this because I was kind of like not sure I was going to talk about, I was thinking about trying to keep things precise and concise. That's not what we do here. Uh, but <laughs> and, and, and that's hard for me because I tend to... Uh, Ramble. Well, let me catch up with a question. I have a coach. Yeah. I want to f- ask him it before I forget. When you went into the studio to make, because uh, now, I mean, Peter's, you know, a, a longtime studio engineer, worked on a million records, um, engineering and mixing and, and producing here in town, mostly th- at Flower Studio, which is one of the uh, most active uh, studios in town for making indie rock records, uh, owned by Ed Ackerson. Great reputation, great gear. Um, the first time you went in to make a record with the Bloods, were you really interested at that point? Did you like you were like, oh, look at these microphones and look at all this stuff? I would really like to get into doing this, or were you still more focused on the drums? Did it influence you that first studio? Experience? I was more focused on the drums, but I was already thinking about production stuff, and I had already, uh, when I was in high school, I had taken just some like. Hennepin technical, like a little, you could take these classes. It would be like four or five weeks. I took a, a recording workshop out at this place in St. Louis Park and I got a certificate. And we worked on four tracks and this and that. Um, reel to reels? Four track, reel to reel, task, old task cam stuff. So I always had an interest. I, I think as, as soon as as soon as I started performing music with a band and in front of people, I immediately wanted to know what it sounded like. You know what I mean? Or not being uh, a terribly, uh, I, I'm not proficient on uh, guitar or bass or anything like that, but I've been known to try and write a song, and this, particularly in this first band. We, had a pra- we always had a practice space, and I would kind of do the thing where you record the drums, record it on the boom box, mic up the boom box, play it through the PA, play the guitar to it, record it on another boom box, and, and keep going. So I wrote a couple songs that way. So I've always been record- interested in hearing how things sound recorded, yes. And um, by the time we got to making our first record, it was for a label called Gark Records, which was also the name of a studio owned in town by a guy who went on to work with the Beastie Boys and a guy who was a swim coach. <laughs> and we were produced by the swim coach, <laughs> who was great, actually. Jay Lee also did the Trip Shakespeare's first mm. two records. And he signed. they signed us to Gark Records. And they loved our live show. They loved our demo. We had done Rough and Ready with now them. When we- someone says signed like this, that means there's no advance. Okay, right. It's like, if you get signed to a deal... That's money. If you that get comes, signed to that a came deal. That came later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But um, so anyway, my first record at this point, all my musical experience has just been with these guys. Although there was a diversion when we graduated high school, I did go to college for a couple of years. Everybody in the band went to co- college for a couple of years and was like, we got to do the band. But I was studying music. Uh, I went to college and I studied uh, theory composition for a couple of years up at Uh, UMD, University of Minnesota Duluth, and I was extremely fortunate that the person running the percussion program and the jazz band up there was a guy named Dave Hagedorn, who's now at, he's been at St. Olaf for quite a few years, but he was at UMD that year, and he was a guy who was kind of like, you can be in this program you, uh, you can play in the jazz group, but you're going to have to work very hard at this other stuff because I didn't study music in high school band or anything like that. It was all kind of self-taught 
copying records. This and that, that guy was a big influence on that you. That guy was a huge influence, the best teacher I ever had. And uh, he taught me how to learn a lot of things on the drums. And he also had me practicing to a click track when I was 18 years old, which I had never done before. So basically, these things that came together on my first record, which would have been recorded, you know, 19... 88 or something like that, 87, 88. We got in the studio and we realized these guys, the three of us who've been playing together since we were 11, played together very well, but in whatever tempo <laughs> we wanted to at any given time, we could, it, it was very much an undulating thing. And so the producer, <laughs> yeah, and so as we started to microscope songs and things, um, we realized that there were some issues with really trying to dial it in and and I suggested well why what if I played to a click track and um, so the first record that I ever made I actually went in after a couple failed sessions with the band not sounding tight enough and I played the entire album's worth of drum tracks by myself to a click track <laughs> seriously yeah, and then they overdubbed everything else and you can really tell <laughs> when you <laughs> listen to it. It's pretty, the, it's, it's not uh, a great vibey record, but it is pro sounding. Uh, so that was kind of my early experience with the studio and kind of like taking an extreme approach to production on the very first record that I did. And well, now, also one of the other jobs that you have besides being a drummer in bands like our band is that you have a great reputation in town as a session drummer. You've played, I mean, I'm sure you have no idea how many records you've played on of other bands over the last 15 years, but it's got to be. It's over dozen. 100. Yeah. And so what do you remember, what's the first session you ever did where you were, like, brought in as a session drummer? Well, uh, yeah, because... Aside from, uh, you know, there were a couple things here and there, but uh, basically what happened to me, uh, yeah, it, you know, I, w basically what happened is when my band, the Blo I'll keep this precise and concise, when the Bloods <laughs> broke up in 1989, I had made enough of a, a footprint or established enough through the gigs that we played that I had a certain style of drumming that was different than what other people had that other people immediately wanted to play with me. And I felt very lucky and fortunate. And I don't know if I was actually that good of a drummer at that point anyway. But I started playing immediately with a band uh, that became the Willie Wisely Trio. We started recording, and I, I entered this period after 13 years of just playing with the one band, which was kind of the ideal at the time. I suddenly was playing with the Willie Wisely Trio. About a year into that, I had other people asking me. This band that I talked about, Trip Shakespeare, broke up, and the lead singer, they were a very popular band around here at one point, and the lead singer asked me to play with him. So I started playing, working with him on this project, a guy from the Bloods and I started a band called the Eyeball Bird that had two bass players. And Which is, by the way, the best band name ever in the history of band names. Whatever you guys come up with for your next band, it's not going to be as cool as the Eyeball Bird. And then I, I kind of became fixated with the band's uh, Sonic Youth and My Bloody Valentine, and I started an entirely new band called Saucer, um, along with uh, a guy named Howard Hamilton, who has a band uh, called Prissy Clerks and Red Pens. He and I were in a band and um, a couple other people. So suddenly I had all these bands going simultaneously, and the ideal was still, hey, I've got this band, we're gonna make it, we're gonna do these things, make records and record, but it was becoming confusing because now I had like three, maybe four bands, and how could I possibly do Keep all those together, things yeah. with, with that many different bands? It is true back in the day, which, as Dane Cook says, was, I think, a Wednesday. But uh, uh, back in the day, everyone was in one band, yeah. and that was it. And now nobody's just in one band. Yeah. I think some of that is economic, and there's other factors, too. But here's my big question that I think, if I was these guys, I'd want to know. You're in this one band, and you're that comes to an end, and all these different people want to play with you. And... I know, you know, it's 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 good to sit there and be humble and say I was fortunate, I was lucky and stuff, but there are qualities 
as far as your drumming goes, and I can answer this on my end of why I like playing with you, but um, what do you think if you were giving a recommendation to drummers or guitar players or any of these guys, what are the qualities outside of your playing that you think, why, why was your phone ringing? Because there's a lot of people, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of drummers around. Well, I think it's different now than, what it, than it was for then because I think there was a certain unpredictability and craziness to my playing at that particular point, which people found appealing. And uh, even though I had a certain amount of musical knowledge that I was good at remembering musical forms and making it from the beginning to the end of the song, I could kind of interject this idea that it might explode because I playing on the edge. I overplayed, <laughs> basically, which is something a lot of young players do. Now, I probably, since uh, uh, the 90s, at a certain point, I joined a band got signed to a major label. This was a transition from me being guy in a bunch of bands working as a guard at the Walker Art Center. It was a great job, paid crappy, but I could say from week to week, I, I need these days off, I need to work these days. And they were like, sure, sure, we, you show up, you're great. <laughs> that worked out great, and I would play these gigs, not really making a lot of money. Then it got too tough. I, uh, the saucer band, the, the noisy band, put out a seven inch, somebody at Geffen Records heard it and liked it. And this guy started coming to town to have us take him record shopping mm -hmm. and to see our gigs and stuff. And he was like, I might want to sign you, okay? And so I started kind of honing it down to this band. I was managing, booking this band Saucer. We were trying to get signed. We were starting to book us on tours, this and that. That band broke up right around the time I got fired from the Walker Art Center because I started to not show up. So not showing up is not bad. Not showing up is bad for the <laughs> day job security, even though they have uh, feign tolerating it for a while. The day yeah. that they don't is mm -hmm. the day that you uh, are hurting. But uh, so Saucer broke up. I lost my job. This was kind of the beginning of me being a pro musician because now I needed the money from the gigs. <laughs> And um, within two months of, of the singer quitting Saucer, I got a call from a guy who was a friend of mine who worked for Warner Brothers Records, and he was asking me funny questions like, so I got these friends, and you know they're not sure what they're going to do, blah, 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 this and that, but they might need a drummer, and uh, you know, what do you think, and what are you interested in? And, uh, oh, I'd be interested. I don't know who I thought it might be, but um, a couple months later, then I got a call from uh, Ed Ackerson, who was the owner of Flower Studios, but he had a band called Polera, and he had put out a, a debut record that he had kind of made on his own with the help of a few people, Jason Orris and uh, Matt Wilson, who I had played drums for. I had played drums on the record. And... Uh, they were having getting a lot of attention. There was a lot of excitement surrounding this band, Polera, and they found themselves in a position where they needed a, a permanent uh, mem member, a committed member. They had a um, Matt playing drums, and he was also pursuing a solo career and not able to make that commitment. And so I joined Polera in 95 and kind of jumped into, this is my job, this is what I do. I'm in a band. We got signed to Interscope Records. We... Uh, made a couple records for Interscope. I spent four f years, basically 95 to the end of 99, uh, where that was the focus. We'd go on tours opening for Garbage, The Wallflowers, Dandy Warhols, and... Um, what kind of venues were you in? You were in, like, theaters like the Orpheum State Theater and theaters like clubs the Orpheum like State, First Avenue? But uh, sometimes clubs, just like the ones I still play when I go on tour. Um, Sometimes festivals, uh, Polera played the Rev Fest. Uh, there was a thing called Rev Fest back in the day that would draw 20,000 people. We played that a couple times. Um, but that was my introduction to like a new, different kind of like, oh, this is the world you dreamed about where you get to eat Thai food every day and uh, maybe somebody else is buying it and <laughs> you're, tr you're touring on a bus and this and that. It was cool. But the last thing I'd want to do is be on a bus with a bunch of people that eat Thai, Thai food, food every day because yeah. that's just nasty. 
but that was sort of my introduction then to there being sort of like a new level on in recording. And previous to that, so I had recorded with these other groups, but it was never really a... Uh, um, now we would record something and, you know, uh, Jimmy Iovine, Tom Wally at I Interscope Records would be deciding whether the song was good enough to, uh, you know, it was a whole new ball game. And I learned a lot about the music business and, and I was a little bit, uh, being the drummer, I was a little bit on the sidelines in, in, in a certain respect. I wasn't writing the songs, I wasn't it wasn't my head on the chopping block in, in that way, but it was difficult, and um, the band never had a hit, and eventually we left uh, the label, and I had the benefit of that experience and those experiences, and I, um, uh, the band still exists, you know, as a name and an entity, but we, and, and we put our records in the 2000s, but I guess what I'm trying to say then, Towards the end of that Polaire experience, Ed built Flower Studio, and he started to produce Friends. I think the first studio record I played on for an out-of-town person was um, uh, John Strom, a guy who had a band, was in a band called the Blake Babies, and he was a guitar, oh, yeah. guitar player in the Lemonheads. He was Ed's best friend. He came to Minneapolis, the first record that was made at Flowers. Um, other than a Polara record, was a John Strom solo album. And you drummed it. And I played drums on it. So that was kind of my, wow, I'm a sesh guy. Now, this is cool. And um, started to do some other things uh, around town. People would um, call. I started to, as, as Polara activity sort of, w when the label deal went away, we weren't, we were kind of left in a position where we uh, hadn't, continued to do indie rock style touring while we were on a major label. And so when all the sort of like uh, glorified, uh, backed stuff, that expensive touring went away, we weren't necessarily, we didn't have a van, we weren't in a position to kind of like, we hadn't really built our indie audience. And so uh, it was day-to-day -day stuff, Ed kind of turned his, uh, his uh, uh, thoughts to record production, and we still did some gigs, but I started playing with other people. Uh, 99, I met a, uh, a uh, guitar player. Uh, I met on the day he moved to Minneapolis, I met a guy named David Shells, who's one of my best friends, uh, was the lead singer, is the lead singer for a band I'm in now called The Ocean Blue. And so I met him, I was playing gig in a garage and I met him, and uh, within six months, I was uh, the drummer in the Ocean Blue, and I have been since. And these guys, two thousand, just put out a record that you put out a record this year. We produ self-produced. I co-produced and and you toured it from L.A. It. to they played in Peru, yep. like a few months ago. We played. Peter emails me from Peru, Peru and Paraguay, and, and a girl recognized him in a grocery store, in Peru because he plays in the Ocean Blue. Isn't it, was, did I get that right? Wasn't there some girl that was like, oh my gosh, you guys are the Ocean Blue. I mean, it was like, it wasn't Beatlemania, but I'm sorry, that's never happened to me. Uh, that, if, not me personally, but somebody took a picture of yeah. him. In a I mean, it was, this is band. The people who are into this band are really into this band. And for, uh, because of the style of their music, they actually have a, you say, a, a, a large following in the Hispanic community or certain Hispanic communities because yeah. of the romantic nature of the uh, I'm speculating on that I just know that for some reason in the early 90s uh when the ocean blue started and I wasn't the drummer they uh were signed by the same guy that you know put out Madonna's records and Talking Heads and this and that and they had a lot of success on MTV and um some minor hits and they would go out and open for all the English bands. People thought they were British, but they were these kind of Beach Boys looking guys from Hershey, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, uh, you know the it type. Sounds like the Smiths, sounds like the Echo and the Bunnymen. Uh, it's cool stuff, and, and we're still uh, doing that. Uh, but I met him like in this period of time where sort of the main thing I was doing, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to establish here is this idea of um, relationship chains, okay? Let's, uh, I'll, I'll draw in my, my stories aren't, I'm not that good of a storyteller, so it's, but I'll try and like dial it in a little bit. Relationship chains. Um, Ed Ackerson, 
Polera would have done sound for the Bloods and the Willie Wisely Trio at the 7th Street Entry, the first real club I played in my life. Then I joined Ed Ackerson's band, you know? Now I work at his studio. That's a relationship that's spanned since the mid-80s. Right. You know what I mean? That's still going, but it's not the only one. Then there's other relationships. David Shelzel I met. That relationship, the Ocean Blue, has released records here and there and gone and played these indie tours. Uh, but lo and behold, 13 years after I first started playing, or first met him, we released this record that we made in his basement this year. It made the Billboard Heat Seekers chart. We toured. I'm actually making money off of rec selling records for the first time in my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hold on one second. <laughs> making money off of selling records. <laughs> <laughs> not a lot of money. But, but money. Not a lot of money by some people's standards, but I guess one th thing to communicate, too, is like my standard of living and what part of what's enabled me to like do this for a long time and sort of like keep the love alive is that I don't require I a lot of what I require to be happy in life is provided by the actual making of music right <laughs> in itself and actually uh that's become even only even more so as time has gone by. There are times, I, I find when uh, you're in your 20s, even into 30s, when, when that's the only thing in your life, it, and, and it's too much of an obsession, if that's the only facet of your life, then that can be a little bit crushing. Disappointments can be a little more hard to, t uh, yeah. you know what I mean? If everything, if all your eggs are in that basket for happiness, you know what I mean? So as I become more uh, older and more well-rounded as a person and able to appreciate things other than music and my professional life, <laughs> which I was pretty much, which is take, I mean, which maybe has only happened in the last No, but like it's years. nice to have a dog. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It sounds silly, but I mean, it's because that dog doesn't care if nobody showed up for your gig. You get home from a gig that sucked and nobody mm -hmm. showed up and that dog is... It's like the second coming of Christ when you walk in that door. That dog is like, oh, my God, you know, well, um, and, and that's I'm, really nice. I'm happily married to somebody who's, uh, whose profession has absolutely nothing to do with uh, the music business and, um, and uh, have realized, too, that it's like because of that, and her job has stresses and things like that, too, so it's like, I can't be, it's, it's it's easy as an entertainer, uh, somebody in the entertainment business to get a little bit, it's all about my Self-indulgent with their moods. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so actually, um, yeah. I think this is, this brings me back to my question of what yeah. I bet is on these guys' minds is like, okay. okay, there's plenty of good drummers around. Why are you the guy that has con been able to make a living in music all these years and i'm gonna step out on a limb because i know you're uncomfortable talking about well i did this awesome and not awesome whereas i could do that all day you guys i think i'm good in the heard. studio i think you're good in the studio but like what more specifically outside of the drumming you know I'll, I'll go through my list just pretend i don't know you i've just hired you as a session drummer we're not pals because um i've worked with a lot of drummers in town a lot of great drummers in town in and out of town and okay, just let's start with the drumming stuff. One thing I like about you is that if no matter what the session is, even if I'm hiring you for a record that maybe is never, nobody's ever gonna hear, it's just maybe some lawyer who wants, he just writes songs on the side and he wants to make a record, all right? That's kind of a, it's not a big glory gig, you know? Maybe it's probably decent money, but it's like you always show up with multiple snares. That lets me know as a producer, it lets the client know this guy cares. The second thing is you always show up having the songs charted out. You actually are ready. My wife always says, if you want to make millions of dollars and be, or be at the top of your professional, then all you have to do is show up, all right? Because a lot of people just don't show up. Any yeah. drummer that doesn't show up for a session for, of me Walker Art Center. Delete his, yeah. I didn't delete, show up. They forget your name. I'm never going to call that guy again. Um, second thing, if you want to be the king of your profession, show up prepared to work. 
show up on time, prepared to work. Now that, if I get that, I'm so happy. And then if you want to be king of the world, show up on time, prepared to work, and actually work. <laughs> That's what she says. Yeah. And it's true. When you show up for a session, whether it's a glamour puss session with you know Paul Westerberg or whether it's something for just some guy making a record, you always show up You on time, you know the songs, um, and you show up with multiple snares, so you give the producer and the client, the artist, you know, choices which they like. It empowers them, and it shows that you care about this record. So that's one thing as a drummer, plus the fact that you've been around a while. There's a lot of different styles that you can actually play comfortably, and there's a bunch more that you can fake good enough where I don't know the difference. You know what I mean? Because we've gotten called... Me and him and Steve Price, who most of you guys know, have this kind of wrecking crew. We, the three of us, have played on millions of records together as the art, you know, the band behind Artist X. And there's some stuff we don't know, but we've gotten. When you get old, you, you get pretty good at faking this stuff. So that's another thing I appreciate is the wide palette, as opposed to like that's just not the way I play. Some drummer says that to me. It's like, well, you're just not the guy I call, <laughs> you know, because the song tells us what to do. We're not in charge. The artist is in charge and the song is in charge. You have to serve that song. Um, but on the, so on the drumming level, that, plus you're one of the drummers in town who actually knows how to tune a kit so it sounds good because that can be, there's a lot of really great drummers that don't know how to maintain or tune their kits. And you have a bunch of different kits besides snares, you'll show up with different, different kits. Now on the personal side, that's the part I really wanted to focus on because I think that's so much of who gets the gigs. There's plenty of good drummers around whose phones don't ring because, not that they're bad people, but they just don't get the hang. And you've worked with a lot of easygoing artists and you've worked with a lot of difficult artists. I'm not gonna ask you which category I fall into, <laughs> but <laughs> we both have, you know, in this thing that we have uh, for the last few years, uh, we've worked with some guys that are easygoing and easy to get along with and some guys that aren't easy to get along with, but you can get along with anyone, probably even more than me. Pricey has that going on too. And I just wanted you to talk about, is that something that you, have you always been kind of chill like that? Or well, I've made is that mistakes something you worked on? Over the years, and I've learned from uh, the mistakes, I think. I mean, I, I, let's take some kind of like uh, um, stereotypical, I mean, I can remember being in the studio saucer with Brian Paulson and being the guy sitting at the back of the room like, can you turn the snare up a little bit? I can't <laughs> really hear the- Oh, the more me guy. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? And now as an engineer, I recognize certain things. It was just kind of like, oh, yeah, now, of course, you want to hear more of yourself and this and that. But, y you know, it, learning, uh, getting better is, is, is a process of making mistakes and um, hopefully still pulling it out of the hat, e even though regardless. So, and, and, and I think I've gotten a good appreciation for that. I walked into engineering now. I've okay, been playing drums for a long time. And when you're playing drums in your own band, you're not going to get fired from, <laughs> from the session. Right. And people might get upset and stuff. Y you know what I mean? But it's a different dynamic. I think than once I was in a band on a label, I started feeling a lot of pressure from myself. But also, we were making records in a bit of a pressurized situation. A lot of money to, behind it. Probably. Yeah. And I think the thing you know that I became aware of at that certain point was my approach to playing, you know, how good is my time? This is around late, mid-90s, is around the same time that it's suddenly like everything's recorded on a click. And not only that, we're using drum machines and samples and sequence things in the context of the music we're making. So if the drums are like too liquid, you know what I mean? This was my thing. Oh, he's got some swing, he's got some flair, it's got a good, energy it it swings you know what i mean but when you start like trying to realize that in the studio and you're playing along with drum machines that are playing very square and the real drums have to add up it all has to add up man that was a, an education i know a lot of drummers of not of my age and younger it's it's a process i think younger drummers it's less of a hurdle because a lot of drummers are growing up now playing all music you hear, 90% of the music you hear day in throughout the day is on a grid. You know yeah. what I mean? But I grew up listening to classic rock and, and you know, Jimi Hendrix and... and uh, not on a click. <laughs> stuff that's not on a click and, and, uh, and sort of championing the idea that uh, 
that time is a is a sort of liquid thing that things speed up, things get slower. But actually, in the studio, um, that was that was a realization where I was like, "Wow, you know, now once I was seeing my music on a screen, it's not just <coughs> tape, you know." Yeah. Once once that came into the studio, I was like, "Look, you know, producer, come here. Look, all of your kicks are early." <laughs> And all of your snares are late. You're very consistent. <laughs> Consistently But off. your kicks are always early. Your <laughs> snares are always late. And the drum machine's never early or late. And that sounds like a flam. Do something about it. Yeah, right. So I did. And I spent a lot of time in the practice room in the late 90s. And uh, well, a lot of us that yeah. grew up without a click and then had to transform to it, some people make it, some people don't. The same thing with bass players. Dick Shopto tells a great story about raking a record in Muscle Shoals. And Rick Hall, the legendary producer at Muscle Shoals, they go in and they start playing the band that, that Shopto is in. He's playing his bass, and the Rick Hall looks at him and says, Son, step into the other room. And Dick goes into the other room. He's like, Uh oh. You know, and uh, Rick Hall hooks him up to a compressor or a mic pre or something that had a VU on it. He says, you just play eighth notes on this bass. Now, when you get to the point where you can play them eighth notes for a few minutes straight and the needle always goes to the same place, you come and get me. I'll be in the other room making a record. And <laughs> you come get me. That's when you're ready to play on the record. And so he had to sit there and do the same thing. Yep. You know. You have to always improve your skill set. And so my big push and my, uh, you know, Polaire was not very busy at that time. We were just trying to write a song that might sound like a hit to somebody sitting behind a desk so we get a chance to make another record. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time practicing to a click track in the rehearsal space. Nothing but drummers down at City Sound during the day. And uh, I would turn on the click track and practice very simple beats, 40 beats per minute. <laughs> And I record myself on a boombox. If I play it back and it sounds like I'm trying to play to a click track at 40 beats per minute, fail. The idea is you get put it in the pocket. But I'd do that for like a half hour, you know? And I ran into somebody at the, at the pop machine one day who I knew was another drummer. I had heard, gotten wind that this guy was a, had a space in the building. I don't remember how, but I knew he existed. And I was at the pop machine one day and he was there and I said, hey, you're Michael Baker, aren't you? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm Peter Anderson. Michael Baker uh, was uh, Whitney Houston's drummer and musical director, and I knew he was from the Twin Cities, and he happened to have a room. And this was 99, 2000. This was a very formative, changing time for me. So I'm working really hard and trying to get better, and I'm sitting here talking to one of the top drummers in the world. It's like, okay, so I have a question for you. He hears me. He's evidently down there. He hears me doing this every day. <laughs> and I'm like, so the guys that play in the studio, all the sessions and stuff, you always hear about this guy is great, and we always have him because he plays behind the beat. He, this guy's a little on top of the beat. And said, how on is on? I want to know. You know. And he's like, on is right on, down the middle, every time. Every time. He said, thank you. Good That's night. what they do. <laughs> and I did. I said, thank you. I, now I know. You know, I'm hearing it from someone that I believe, and now I know this is a standard. Well, relationship chains, okay? Michael Baker then said, hey, um, you should come down to check out my room here, okay? Michael Baker w is endorsed by Yamaha. He had... A rehearsal space full of Yamaha drums, but also pretty much anything Yamaha made other than like a snowmobile, <laughs> a motorcycle. But he had a room full of recording gear, and he's like, hey, you know, I'm down here. I'm making my transition from being top pro drummer into trying to be a producer because I compose, and I'm writing some songs and some things, some projects that I'm trying to get going. Look at this. I got this room full of gear. You want to learn how? Why don't you learn how to <laughs> run it? Samplers. And this has really stuff. just happened. So, recognizing opportunity, I wrote a few things down because I didn't know what the hell I'm going to talk about here. It was like career longevity. I'm sure we're going to talk about things I've done. But my stories, 
They're kind of fun, but they're maybe fun when they come out spontaneously over a beer or something. But this whole idea of like relationship chains and recognizing opportunity. Okay. That's huge. So here I am, not knowing quite what's going on, but I'm spending all this time in the rehearsal space. Now I know what to work on for my drums. Thank you, Michael. Now I have an opportunity. I'm also working on recording and sampling. I'm into that at this point and stuff, making beats. And suddenly I'm learning how to run this guy's uh, Roland 1680. And lo and behold, a few months later, hey, I'm going to produce this record for Georgia, this Italian artist that I've been working with. And, oh, we have to do this track for Aretha Franklin, who's going to... Oh, hey, wait, this is her. You know, we're hanging out in a practice room, and he's talking to Clive. You know, so I'm suddenly I'm stepping into this thing where the one thing is receding a little bit, but because of these new relationships, you know, because you just never know. And I ended well, the, up... One of the lessons here just, is, because that could have gone a way different way. Meet a guy at the soda fountain, he says, yeah, I play with um, Whitney Houston. And you go, in your mind, oh, that's oh yeah, that's not my bag. I can't stand her. Yeah. You know? And then go get your, you know, Dr. Pepper and move on. Yeah. And people do that. My, my theory on this is that people I say, you got to get that lucky break. You got to get that lucky break. If you stay in the music business long enough, you're going to get your lucky break. The problem is when the, you get it, not, not, not a, most people, I don't know what the percentage is, but a lot of people aren't paying attention. Yeah. Because they've got their, well, because they've got their head up their butt. You know what I mean? They're thinking about themselves instead of thinking about this huge world of music. I'm telling you, if you meet, if you go out to the soda machine out in IPR and you meet Whitney Houston's drummer, you know, I love Whitney Houston. <laughs> I've always loved Whitney Houston. How can I help you? You know what I mean? That's well, what you say. Yeah, I didn't, I, I, and I didn't have an even open have mind. to play it. it. It was interesting because yeah. we basically became friends based on the fact that we're drummers. But yeah. then we were also had these easygoing personalities and got along. And because music is cool. And so that relationship still exists. He lives in Italy now. He's come back. You know, I would just email them today. Hey, are you in town for Thanksgiving? But, you know, because of that, question about drums i ended up becoming like his production assistant we i ended up handling a lot of the arrangements when this artist came to town he came we made this record at the old master mix okay that's my first introduction to master mix when tom uh, used to run it and his uh, son was uh, the engineer and that james hardley was one of the engineers um, Ricky Peterson came in, he was the hired musician, but I was the guy that was organizing all these things, and then he was like, okay, set up in here with your sampler and your turntable, and just do stuff. We're, we're, <laughs> we're going to need stuff from time to time. Ricky Peterson was a guy you could give, he'll be there, he'll do stuff, you know? Yeah. We're writing these songs, we're sub so I was doing stuff, and one day he came and he said, you know, uh, Herbie Hancock, has agreed to play on the record because she did a thing with him once and he's going to return the favor since she's in the States, blah, blah, blah. I need you to get a bunch of Herbie Hancock samples and like, you Do know, like, with like write a song kind of thing. <laughs> Something that we can, with Herbie samples, that we can have Herbie play on. So I did. <laughs> and it was pretty cool. And they ended up, like, you know, taking it and, and, uh, uh, and uh, oh, yeah. So I did that. And then the next day, he was like, um, I need you to book a studio in L.A. because Herbie's not coming to Minneapolis in January right. to record on this record. Because he's not an idiot. <laughs> so we need to move the entire session to L.A. So I need you to find a studio. And then 20 minutes later... I actually need you to find two studios. But, but anyway, I I had this incredible whirlwind experience of like figuring out how to book two studios, two engineers in LA, move it out so they could be mixing in one, doing vocals in the other. And, you know, it kind of cul culminated with a, a thing that I'll always remember as being cool is Herbie Hancock actually pulling up to the studio in his Ferrari. And I'd rented the right roads, you know, I'd been on the phone with his tech for, and he was like, literally said to me, this was my introduction to LA, you know, it's like, he's like, okay, 
Now, you just got to understand now, this is going to be like a military operation. He really said it to me. He's like, this has got to run like a military operation, okay? We've got these couple hours. He's going to drive from Beverly Hills. He's going to come. I need you to call us. It's got to be this, Fender Rhodes, this pedal, blah, blah, blah. And I got to sit on the floor right by the Rhodes while he played on the tune that I wrote. It was pretty cool. So cool things like that happen. I'm not rich, and I'm not, you know, I'm, the thing I was trying to communicate overall about kind of like being happy with a certain lifestyle that your chosen field affords, I guess, I may have greater success at some point. I don't know, you know what I mean? But in the meantime, I do have enough things flowing because of these relationship chains and my ability to form new ones, you know? Like, I was just kind of thinking about that, like what I'd done in the last 20 days and then w 20 years ago, what I had done in the last 20 days. And it's still all these multiple things. But in the, uh, in the last 20 days, man, I've done a lot of stuff. We've recorded tunes and rehearsed. I've, record I've rehearsed and played shows with three different artists. I've uh, played, done rehearsals with like more artists than that for things that are happening next month. Uh, Flowers, uh, I've recorded uh, a guy from New York. We did a bunch of basic tracks. And at the end of the session, he was so pleased. He talked about me coming out. Oh, what do you think? You know, I'm setting up my studio in Brooklyn. Maybe you could come out and help me do that. Cool. Let's talk about that. Yeah. You know, I played this gig in Red Wing last weekend, a couple weekends ago, whatever weekend it was. It was like in the last 10 days. The end of the thing, this guy who was organized that runs a music school down there was like, oh, we're thinking about you know, opening a studio or putting together a studio. Maybe you come down and help me do that. I was like, yeah, because I'm a studio builder, right? No, but again, I'm sort of like, my eyes are going like, yeah, but I'm also not like a lot of things that I became or learned how to do as time goes on. So you keep your radar open and so I'm playing gigs for a hundred bucks or whatever and making it come together, making my rent making. And then, and, but you never know what's going to happen. You're going to yeah. cut drums at last week. Uh, in fact, right as I walked in here, I'd got a, a, an email from a guy I did a session with last Tuesday, last Wednesday, a band played at target center emblem three Tuesday. The band had a day off in Minneapolis. They came into flowers and I cut them uh, uh, recording a backing track where the band's going to pretend they're playing while the guys sing, you know, uh, on X Factor next week. So it'll be on there. And it turned out great, and it was fun. I met all these guys, you know, the guy that plays with Kesha or whatever, you know. The, you just never know what's going to happen. But, you know, I made the same, whether I would have been recording him or recording... Right. Uh, just but you, that's the worst and best thing about what we do for a living yeah. is you never know what's going to happen. That can drive you mad, but it's also like kind of fun because, I mean, that's one thing. If you have a straight up nine to five job, you always know what's going to happen. Well, and you have to take pride in that. You have to go like they're both whoever it is, dude, just writing a song for his girlfriend. I get those all the time, too. I wrote a song for my girlfriend and I really want to record it. And the studio owner will call me and say, like, you should take this one. <laughs> you know? But yeah. you know what? They, they all get, I give them the same True. attention and the same follow-up. The guy that recorded the song for his girlfriend had all kinds of things that he doubted and followed up with me. Can we change this? Can we do this shit? Just like this guy just calling me. He's like, oh, man, can I get, you know, I don't have Pro Tools, and the mixer has the Pro Tools session, but now I need consolidated files of all the... Um, all the uh, uh, tracks so I can open it in Reaper or something. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> sure, no problem. It might take overnight, but I can get it to you. But everybody gets the same treatment. I think that's how you build relationship chains and how things that might seem like they're nothing Because you never know. Other that guy who wrote yeah. a song for his girlfriend, you don't know. He might have 50 girlfriends, and he wants to write a song for each of them. So that could turn into, like, Ironically, a whole thing. A whole cottage industry. Ironically, there, he just called me and he does have a new girlfriend and a new song. <laughs> and I'm not making it up and I'm not going to tell you who it is. So. That is awesome. 
But yeah, so it's kind of crazy. He has a new girl. Well, but part of part of what writing I like the song for the old girlfriend didn't seem like it worked out very well for him. Here's so the he's thing. gonna do it again. Here's the thing. It was a good song, actually. Uh, of course, it was. You can. I'm not saying this is the only way. I'm a drum. It's been very freelance, you know. When I was thinking about what I was gonna, I was a little nervous about what am I gonna talk about. I'm probably gonna say too much, and very little will be communicated. <laughs> but I was kind of like, oh man, I, d I don't have. I, why can't I just show on my web page that has a discography and this and that? I was like, oh, because I don't have one. Because I haven't taken the time to organize things like a pro would and this and that and you should put energy into that stuff and you should and I should and I will but in the meantime I'm really busy working yeah. you know it's a shame that you're too busy working so you don't have time to promote yourself and, and that's and sad it, every day uh, every day that I think I'm gonna get eight hours in the practice room behind the drums that's a great day on paper and it usually turns into uh, three hours of emails and phone calls that I didn't expect, followed by something, followed maybe by an hour to two of practice, if I'm lucky. So, you know, it's just like one thing I'm trying to, because my greatest teacher of all time at UMD, I remember I spent a lot of time in the practice room when I was 20, 19, 20. And when I decided to leave, he's like, that's cool. And I still am in touch with this guy. I still see him. I still, you know, uh, he's like, just remember, you know, you're going to leave and that's cool because I know you're going to do this band and, and, and stuff, but you're not going to be spending eight hours a day in the practice room anymore. I'm just t talking because you guys are in school right now. And not everybody's doing school full time. You got other responsibilities too, but you do have access to the studio. You do have like, an excuse to do nothing but put your energy in to maximize it. That's all I can say. Don't, like, um, do your homework in the studio. <laughs> you yeah. know, do your math homework in the studio if you have the opportunity. Put yeah. yourself in the position to maximize your time because he was absolutely right, you know. Yeah, standing around the Walker Art Center telling people not to touch the art is not the same is practicing so it's like and now and i don't feel bad about that uh, you know what uh, whatever i wasn't in school to be a choir teacher whatever most of the people i was in school with were but um it was a beautiful thing that i appreciate now how wow i could go in there and just hammer on yeah concepts now and now i don't have as much time i have to be it's more brain work i have to, to practice more and logistics and, yeah we should uh, ask these guys if they have any questions for Peter. Remember, Please. our policy in DIY, no question is too inappropriate or too personal for our guests. There's one Hi. right now. Hopefully both inappropriate and personal. Yeah. Okay. Advice for young drummers? Yeah. Um, well, I would say uh, definitely uh, practice to a click track. Practice to a click track slowly. Make that part of your routine. Whatever else you're trying to do, spend at least 10 minutes each practice routine playing simple things very slowly to a click track. The reason is slowly gives you a better appreciation for judging those spaces try and record yourself on your phone or some device that you're not using as your click track and listen to it back and go like does that sound the way i want it to because that's the great thing about recording does that sound the way i want it to if not change the way you're playing it but that's only one part of it because music doesn't happen in the practice room music happens when you're playing with other musicians so the other main thing i would say play with other musicians whenever possible, whether you're getting paid or not. Jam sessions, blues gigs, do it. Just uh, it, the more you're, as a drummer, the more you're playing with uh, other people, the more it's all gonna make sense, the more skills you're gonna get, those people skills, listening skills. There's a question. Hi. Uh, 
Um, well, uh, at that point, then the, just the whole idea of playing with as many different musicians as you can in different contexts. I mean, this will sound stupid, but uh, I used to live like half a block from Famous Dave's in Uptown. And every Sunday night, they have an open blues jam. And my wife and I just loved going down there and checking that out. Because it would be like there'd be people up there that had played with Ray Charles playing with somebody that could barely get their head around one, four, five. And uh, there was nothing metronomic going on there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, playing with other people and, and developing the sensitivity and listening to different kinds of music. The thing about the click track is just that time is the universal, uh, regardless of, of if things become liquid and flowing within the context, you have to know where the time is to count off a tune to get everybody in the same page. But yeah, people do practice uh, to a click track and with drum machines, or everybody has a drum machine on their phone now, you know what I mean? It's much different. So I'm not saying that to get the, um, the good feel and, and, and the uh, appreciation for things that do speed up and slow down, of course, is best learned playing um, with other people where that naturally occurs. I was trying to clock a song the other day um, by Billy Squire, Don't Ask Why. And uh, that would have been uh, recorded in the 80s, probably hard rock 80s. thing, early 80s. And so I would have thought, you know, most things in the studio probably at that era were already being done on a click. Not this song. <laughs> Not Same with song. that, like Earth, but Wind, and Fire stuff. But if it didn't matter, stuff. it didn't matter. It still feels great. Yeah. You know what I mean? Earth, Wind, and Fire. Dick was had to do, Shopto had to do some stuff with some Earth, Wind, and Fire tracks, and he was listening to that, and he was like, that's some of the funkiest stuff of all time. And apparently the time's all over the place. Hmm. You know, so you you never know. I think there's a, a night spent at home with your laptop working on Ableton. That's cool. But for every night you spend doing that, unless you just want to be an Ableton guy, but if you want to be a musician who plays with other musicians, go down to Famous Dave's on Sunday night. Well, no. or this, you know, this is what I'm doing right now. I've been making playlists uh, with the, uh, I don't use Spotify, I've got this thing called Mog. So I've been going through and looking for jazz tunes that don't have drums on them, like uh, just bass and piano and stuff. And I, because I've been practicing brush playing and a lot of things like that. So I, play, I mean, playing along to records is how I learned how to play. And it, it might sound silly or cliched or whatever, but play along to records, yeah. Mm -hmm. Too. And, and, and that's, for, that's a good way, actually, with jazz, because in jazz, if you take away the drums, you'll find guys have really good time, but they're playing around the time all the time in terms of where they land. You know, the bass player might be right down the middle, but the saxophone player might be leaning way behind. So playing along the records like that sharpens your listening skills. You start hearing where people are leaning and how that feels and how to access. Th you know, once you identify a feeling, then practicing how to access that on command, that's the yeah. whole thing. I mean, God, I'll be doing that until I can't play drums no more, you know? Well, it's, it's kind of like that joke you made in, I don't know if it was like at a gig or a rehearsal. It was a couple of years ago, but it really made an impression on me. It was something about how you made a subtle joke about how it never looks like it, but the drummer really is kind of always running the show. And if the other musicians in the band are smart, they'll let them, if the drummer's right. Remember when you made that, that well, joke? But well, and, and the show might suck, and it might be because the drummer's not running the show very well. You know? <laughs> right, but uh, yeah. if you get a, if you, I think the point is, from my p position where I'm usually working with a great drummer, if, if you're working with a great drummer, let them. Don't, like, dominate the time. I learned that one from playing with Buck Hazlett. May he rest in peace. Yeah. Um, we got time for one more question, then we got to fly. How'd this guy. Well, <laughs> that album is called Moon Zoo by the Bloods. And I will tell you, um, I actually have a picture. I don't think it's on there. I, I was in Cheapo Records recently, and I, uh, the guys that I went to first grade with that I had that band with, I texted them a picture. I was like, man, you guys, it's taken a long time. But we have our own browser now. In the Cheapo Record Store collection, there's actually enough 
copies of the Bloods vinyl record to warrant having a browser in the local section. <laughs> of Milestones. Course, of course, Milestones. That's, a, that's a used record store. That means people don't <laughs> want that record anymore. But there were new copies, too. It's coming around. I can yeah. feel it. Um, well, thanks for listening, you guys. This is Peter Anderson. He's easy to find uh, on Facebook and stuff like that if you have any follow-up questions or anything like that. So, And he's around uh, here a lot in AP200 uh, teaching how to record drums. And I also stuff have like gigs that. this week. I'm playing with the Honey Dogs at First Avenue on uh, Wednesday. And then actually... That band I was talking about, The Ocean Blue, uh, we have a new song. One of the things I did in the last 20 days was record and mix a new song and uh, that's on this compilation All that we'll have Saturday at the Cedar, the Ocean Blue, Cedar Cultural Center, Ocean Blue, and uh, a bunch of our friends that have a, a kind of a label collective called Corda Records are playing a show at the Cedar. So you can come out and see me then or yeah, Find me online. Um, I've got somewhat of a presence. All yeah. right. Thanks. Peter Anderson, everybody. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.